A recent study finds the essence of innovation in creative pairs, whether they're friends or rivals. Picasso and Matisse, or the 17th century Italian architects Bernini and Borromini, or sometimes allies, the French historians Marc Bloch, Lucien Febvre, or Paul Otlet and Henri Lafontaine, two Belgians who tried to create a new system of knowledge in the 1920s, 1930s. More generally, think of the complementary roles of charismatic leader and bureaucratic leader, Christ and St. Paul in early Christianity, Luther and Melanchthon in early Protestantism, and so on. But I think a concentration on pairs would be as misleading as a concentration on single individuals. Take the case of the discovery of the double helix. It's been mythologized as the work of the pair <coughs> Francis Crick and James Watson, thanks in particular to Watson's best-selling book. But they weren't alone. They were competing with Linus Pauling. They were engaged in a race against time, uh, fearing that he was going to get there before them. They were working with a colleague, Morris Wilkins, who shared the Nobel Prize with them. And in any case, they gained crucial information from the crystallographer Rosalind Franklin, the so-called dark lady of DNA, who didn't, at least at the time, get the credit that she deserved for her contribution to the collective discovery. So I believe that the main locus for creative interaction is a small group, face-to-face -face group, especially if it meets regularly. And ideally, should be composed of people with common interests but different approaches, because they were educated in different countries or because they practiced different disciplines. Take the case of the so-called Pareto Circle at Harvard in the 30s and 40s, an academic study group. It was di discussing Pareto's work. It included the sociologists Talker Parsons, the historian Crane Brinton, more surprisingly maybe, the biochemist Lawrence Henderson. All these people were innovative individually, but they were still more innovative together. A number of new ideas in the social sciences in the 1950s can be traced to this group. In, in the end, Parsons got most of the credit. Not altogether justly, I think. In the academic world, the formal locus of intellectual exchange, creative sociability, is often a seminar. Or thinking of more permanent institutions, an institute of advanced study where people from different disciplines can meet daily for conversations for six months or a year. I know I owe an, a great debt both to the Princeton Institute and um, its imitation in Berlin, the Wissenschaftskolleg, precisely for that interaction with colleagues. But informally, fruitful exchanges often take place in a club or society especially in the English-speaking world, since the, um, the British, in particular, are very fond of clubs. Um, Adam Smith um, virtually invented economics by talking to merchants in the political economy club in Glasgow when he was living there. An interesting an exchange between the practical knowledge of merchants and the philosophical theoretical ideas of Smith. In other countries, more informal exchanges take, have taken place in a cafe or a bar, regularly frequented by a group of friends with common interests. It's what the Spaniards call a tertulia. It was a great institution in Spain in the late 19th, early 20th century. 
there'd be a special table reserved for this group of friends and they would meet um, one particular um, day of the week so that the proprietor knew they were coming. And I certainly wouldn't deny the suggestion that drinking, especially drinking in public, is a stimulus to creativity, lubricating speech and making possible an intellectual jam session. So the cafe or the bar is part of what's been called the soft infrastructure, helping to generate a flow of ideas and inventions. Take the example of London in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. There was a proliferation of coffee houses in which the customers not only read the newspaper, but they conversed. Some coffee houses specialised in particular kinds of conversation. Lloyd's was the place to find merchants. Childs and Garraways attracted what we call scientists, known at the time as natural philosophers. Wills was the haunt of poets. Something similar existed in Vienna in the early 20th century. Uh, Vienna, before 1914, was famous for its cafes. One of them hosted a discussion group in the philosophy of science. Met every Thursday and included Otto Neurath, a founder of an interdisciplinary movement for unified science. Today, so the management theorist Nonaka tells us, certain Japanese firms have established talk rooms where researchers are expected to discuss one another's work while drinking tea. And some of these firms also hold sessions at, at weekends in inns. At these weekend sessions, the normal rules of discourse in the firm um, are differ greatly from those dominant um, during the week. That is, hierarchy temporarily disappears. The atmosphere at the inns is egalitarian. It allows new ideas to flow along, of course, with the sake. Great alcohol is a great remover of inhibitions. So you're not sure whether this idea is right or useful or not, you might have been shy about coming out with it, but after a couple of drinks, you will have a go. <laughs> In this way, small groups support individual innovators, and they're sometimes responsible for innovation themselves. So then the question is, what supports the small groups? So we come back to formal institutions as the hard infrastructure. Some of them are purpose-built. They're specifically founded to foster innovation. In Britain, there's a government department for business innovation and skills. The Australians have a department of industry, innovation and research. Whether these departments have made a serious contribution to innovation or not, I don't know have to say I'm a bit sceptical. I think indirect approaches are uh, more likely to succeed than direct ones, but it may be best to keep an open mind. Outside the university, besides the government departments, think tanks or laboratories in big companies devoted to R&D, research and development. <coughs> 